six, five, four, three, two, one. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Project Egg Show. Today, we are in Canada still. This is actually going to be the very last episode done in Canada. Um, you know, if you've been you've been following pretty closely, you'll know that uh, the show has been broadcast from a lot of different places lately, from Austin to Oklahoma City, now Canada. Um, so, you know, heading home after today. But anyways, I'm your host, Ben Gothard. Today, we have the honor of speaking with Jonathan Hawkins, CEO of the Hashtag Agent. How are you doing today, Jonathan? I'm doing great. Yourself? Oh, I'm doing fantastic. And thank you so much for coming on the show. It's such an honor to be speaking with you today. Thanks for the invite. Awesome. Awesome. So let's hit the ground running. What is your story? <laughs> what is my story? That's a, a very broad question. But uh, I, I was uh, the youngest military intelligence officer in the Army. And I decided to get into real estate while I was spending some time at UCLA. Got into real estate, opened up a real estate brokerage. And after several years, I went into the training, coaching, and speaking business, specifically when it comes to how to use the brain and intelligence into marketing. Um, that's what I'm doing now. So that's kind of a, a little bit about my story. Uh, in 2011, Barack Obama uh, gave me the uh, philanthropist of the year. Uh, so I'm super passionate about helping people. And I think that's why, uh, you know, I went into real estate and then actually you know, decided that, hey, I think I can help more real estate agents. And uh, it just comes from that passion of helping people live in Huntington Beach, have a beautiful wife and a son and uh, love sports. <laughs> so that's, that's kind of my story. Let's talk about your military intelligence career. How did you first get into that? Uh, so I thought I wanted to go into law enforcement or some type of public service. And uh, there was a, a high school that was somewhat local that was a military and law enforcement academy, which most people think of instantly as a troubled or youth, you know, whatever type of school. But it's actually something that you have to apply to get into. And um, I did that starting my junior year in high school. And I was told don't do this. You're making the wrong decision. You're the class president or this or that. Why would you give all that up to go and do this? And, you know, I just, I've always been someone to uh, push me uh, or wanting to be pushed and, and wanting to explore and do bigger things. So uh, I did that and I was actually going to go to the Naval Academy. I got accepted to go to the Naval Academy and some unfortunate events happened. And over the course of two weeks, after graduating high school, I found myself uh, in boot camp at Fort Knox training to become an intelligence officer in the Army. And I was commissioned at the age of, uh, I was commissioned at 19 and a half as an Army officer, which at the time was the youngest Army officer, uh, Army intelligence officer in the Army. So that's what, uh, you know, kind of just drove me to, you know, the reason that I did it was just to just to do something <laughs> so that would push me. What were the, in that two week period, yeah. what were those events that altered your, your course? So I, I didn't put my <laughs> eggs in multiple baskets. I had all of my eggs on the Naval Academy and I did get accepted into the Naval Academy. And actually I, I was told whether it's true or not, I was told that my appointment was given to somebody else. I later came to find out that it was given to an athlete uh, and they needed more room for athletics. And I, I, I found myself uh, on graduation night, not knowing what was going to happen. Uh, the only thing that I knew that was I can go to the community college and then go to uh, a regular college after that. Um, and so I just started calling everybody that I knew and told them what would happen. And since I got into the Naval Academy, I, I had to get a congressional appointment. So I called up the congresswoman and I told her what was going on. 
And uh, I had a general at my house about two days later who was telling me about this special program that 1% of 1% of uh, military officers go through. And that's what I did. That is fascinating. Why is fascinating. it? Yeah. Why is it so competitive? I mean, the 1% of the 1% is extremely selective. Why is it like that? Well, I think that it comes down to just, uh, you know, budget constraints. You can only spend so much money on so many people. And, you know, to go through an accelerated program, you're essentially still learning what you would learn in four years and two years. Most people can't get through that, let alone the four years. So uh, I think that's why it's competitive. Uh, but I think that it's, and it's something that I, you know, quickly realized it's, it was more than just about the physical aspects or the mental toughness. It was, you know, this person is doing other things in his community. This person is, you know, an advocate for helping people. This person, you know, has a leadership uh, roles currently plus potential that's in their eyes, at least uh, a lot greater. And they went for it. <laughs> Once you got into that program, what were some of the things that you learned that you feel have been instrumental to your ability to perform and succeed in life? Yeah. So good question. Pretty much everything that I do or learn came from the military all the way from, you know, making your bed to, uh, you know, intelligence strategies and tactics. I had a, unfortunate scenario two weeks into a uh, boot camp we actually had somebody pass away and that was a quick realization that life is very short and we were going to make the most out of our opportunity and you know i really took that with me and when it comes to integrity and it, when it comes to team building and when it comes to all of these different things you have to remember i'm the youngest one so by the time i graduated and was an officer you now had a 19 and a half year old kid that was in charge of 40 year olds, 45 year olds, people that had been in the military for 20 plus years. So you quickly realize that if you don't have their trust, you're not going to get anywhere. And, you know, there was this sense of, although I know that I can ask people or, you know, quite, an, you know, really, I can demand people to do specific things. I had to do anything uh, and everything that I was asking people to do. And they had to see that um, because if not, and I saw some of my friends, um, you know, basically get revolted against, uh, you know, they weren't going to listen. So my leadership skills really were honed um, by being thrown into the fire. And, and uh, you know, you, you, you don't have an option. You have to uh, lead men and women. And if you're not going to do it, somebody else will, and they'll get rid of you really fast. So you're, you're thrown to the fire. And I've just always been somebody where if you back me up into a corner, I'll find a way out. Those leadership principles, you mentioned how leading by example was big, but I'm sure there must have been other principles or, or leadership philosophies that you had to deploy in order to really lead these people. Like, what were the key foundations of your leadership style that allowed you to lead? Firm, but uh, empathetic were, was who I was. People knew that they were not going to mess around around me. But at the same time, Jonathan will have fun. Jonathan will reward us. Jonathan um, is looking after us during our hard times. But a lot of a lot of leaders think that, you know, if they're firm or if they give direction, they're going to, you know, people don't like that. Well, that's actually what you need um, to guide people is to have some type of structure and some type of accountability. And if you don't have that and if you lose that, then you're never going to gain it back from people. So, um, you know, that was something that was hard for me to adapt to because there was a lot of things that. I was doing that other people should have been doing, but I thought, you know, I don't want to tell too many people to do too many different things, uh, but they actually respect that because uh, you're giving them a sense of, uh, you know, 
them a duty or a task or whatnot. And when they do it or they exceed what you've asked for, then they can be rewarded. And I think that, you know, rewards can come uh, in many aspects. It can come from a simple thank you all the way to uh, promotion. So, you know, just having having that sense of empathy and, and being able to look at the whole picture, I think is, is key. I love what you said about uh, delegation, how when you actually empower somebody else to take on responsibility, then that gives them the ability to perform so then they can get rewarded. That to me is, is a brilliant way to look. I've actually never, never thought about it that way. You're actually giving them the opportunity to go out and, and get the rewards that are meaningful to them. You're also, you're also putting in them, you're putting them in a place where they're either going to do it or they're not. And a lot of people, even, you know, a lot of my friends or a lot of people that follow me on social media, they think a lot of things are very easy until you actually have them do it. And so, you know, to put people uh, in a place where they need to take action is a lot harder to do once you're there uh, than it is to stand on the sidelines and say, you know, he's an overnight success or that's so easy. I can do that. Or I wish I had the silver spoon. Well, it's actually, it doesn't work that way. And people, a lot of people fail because uh, that's all they, that's all they see. It is, is easy, no work. Um, and that's why you have to put people in those situations. And it also allows them to explore what they're good at, what they're not good at. And as a leader, you have to be able to balance somebody's strengths and their weaknesses. Nobody's going to be perfect, but you know, as a whole, as a team, as a platoon, whatever it's, whatever it's going to be, uh, you can lean on others more than some in some degree and the, the other side in other degree. And it's, and it's being able to balance that, which is huge. And, and that only happens by delegating tasks and allowing people to fail, I think is also huge because if you're always there uh, to pick up the slack and you're always there to show them exactly what to do. They're never going to learn how to do it on their own. You mentioned how understanding what your team members are good at, what their strengths and weaknesses are, is critical to be able to delegate effectively. Like you want to give somebody who's really good at math, the, the numbers problem and so on and so forth. I feel as if a part of that though, is also understanding who you are as a person, understanding your strengths and weaknesses. Because if you delegate away your strengths and then take on your weaknesses, that doesn't make any sense. So it seems like there's a very fine balance. How did you develop the self-awareness to understand who you are at your core in order to more effectively work with your team so everybody's working on their strengths? So to, to find out what mine are, I think that's what your question is. I, I know that my, my strength and my weakness is actually the same thing, which is I work too hard. And uh, that's a good thing in some degree. And, you know, that's a, a, a not so good thing in other times. And, um, you know, I don't like to delegate. It's not natural for me to ask somebody else to do something. Why? Because I feel that I can do it better. And if I feel that I can do it better, why would I give that task to somebody? Well, if I'm doing too much, then there's what we would call money producing activities that are not happening. And when you're not doing those types of activities, well, you're not making money. So you kind of have to weigh I think that when it comes from the team aspect, if you have five people on a team that are only doing 80% of what you could do personally, you just increased your team by 400% because you have 80% at five people. And that's how you have to look at a, a, a team. You're not there. Your goal is not to replicate you, especially if you firmly believe that you're the best. Uh, your goal is to make the team the best. And the way that you do that is by relying on people's strengths and weaknesses. And so uh, that's what I did. Let's fast forward now to when you're actually in it. 
I mean, you were out of training, out of school, and you were actually in the thick of it. What did that look like? What was your day to day? Uh, there really wasn't a day to day, unfortunately. Um, I traveled a lot of places. I did the dirty jobs and I did the best jobs. I did admin jobs, a lot of paperwork. Um, you know, being a leader in the military, you're and as an officer, you have quite a bit of roles. For me, it led me into becoming what's called a company executive officer. So you're the second in charge of the entire company. Well, with that, again, you're now seen as the person who does finances. You do uh, admin work. You do strategic missions. You coordinate different things. Um, so I really wouldn't in any degree I wouldn't say that in the military there is a day to day. And if there is, that's probably because you're not motivated to do more. And so you get stuck in this, this is all I do. And those are the people that will never be promoted. And that's, that can be applied to any industry. If your day to day is the exact same for the last 20 years, then how can you expect a raise or a promotion if you're not doing anything other than? the basics or other than, you know, just, you know, the flat line. I think that you have to go above and beyond, uh, not in everything, but certainly you have to, you know, push your strengths a little bit more. And so, yeah, there definitely is not, there wasn't a day to day for me for other people. Maybe there was, but I, I really don't know anybody that had a, a day to day. And that actually is a good thing because, you know, it instilled in me that every day is, is, is not the same, nor is every day going to be perfect. You're going to have bad days. Uh, I think there's a, you know, a percentage out there that your day only counts for 0.002% of your entire life. So if you have a bad day uh, in the grand scheme of things, who cares? And you, know, you realize that as well really fast. When you were moving out of your your duties with the military. What was that transition like for you? How did that impact you as an individual? And things are not run the same in the military as they are in what we would call the civilian world. Um, you have a lot more people who think they're somebody that they're not. You have a lot more personalities. Obviously you have a lot more people. There is no rank structure, there is no leadership structure. Uh, depending on the type of business you go in, uh, there's drastic changes. The good thing about the military is you pretty much have a one foundation, one company essentially, that is founded from the top down and there's a hierarchy. Well, that's, that's not the same. Uh, I guess there's some type of hierarchy in the civilian world, but it's, it's drastically all over the place. So uh, for me, it was it was uh, realizing that nobody was going to uh, help me. Uh, there's a lot more people that want me to fail than succeed. Where in the military, there's a lot more people that want you to succeed because they realize if we succeed, um, or if you succeed, we succeed. That's not the same way um, in any entrepreneurial type business, any business. Um, uh, most people see each other as competition. Where in the military, you see each other as a, a teammate, a brother, a sister, uh, whoever it may be. Uh, and, you know, that camaraderie and that connection with anybody in the military is so close because we know what people have gone through where you, you just don't get that. So that was drastically different. You mentioned how in the civilian world, um, people don't always realize who they are or, or they're trying to be somebody that they're not. Can you, can you go into that a little bit more? Like, what do you mean by that? So in the military, although you don't have a day to day, you do have a goal or you do have a task or you do have a mission. So you have something that you're working towards. You have something that you're trying to accomplish. If you're not trying to accomplish anything, then there's no point of the military when you get out, there's people going in all different directions because they feel like I can become an overnight success. I don't have to work hard. 
I can do whatever I want. It's so easy. Uh, and social media plays a huge aspect in that because 99% of the things that you see on social are only the good things. And, you know, I'm just a huge advocate on creating a business and life that you love. And a lot of people come to me because they want to create a better business. But if their life is in shambles, then their business will never get to the point um, where they want it to be, nor exceed where, where it can go. And, you know, that's, that's kind of what I mean by people are, are all over the place. They see, a, they see a shiny penny come in front of them one day and their whole business plan changes um, from, uh, you know, our company name is going to be this, now it's going to be this. Oh, look at that person just came up with this new color scheme. Maybe we should change our entire stuff. Um, that's, that's just what happens. And so you have to be able to block out a lot of the noise and focus on building relationships as, as a point uh, instead of uh, chasing leads down every day. Uh, and that's how you build a business. Once you transitioned, why did you decide to go into real estate and how did that come about? Good question. So I was uh, not sure if I was going to stay in the military for a career or not. Uh, that's because I reconnected with my now wife. So obviously it was a good decision. And I started looking at different internships. I quickly realized that a college degree didn't mean as much as it used to. You had to have work experience and people wanted to know that uh, you're a good worker, not that you have a college degree because you can have a piece of paper, but if you don't have work skills, if you don't have communication skills, if you don't know how to uh, progress a business forward, it's very hard to find the types of jobs that most college people expect out of college. So for me, I was looking at a lot of different internships. I landed on probably the most scammiest post. I tell this to everybody, um, but it was a real estate uh, job as an intern, unpaid intern. A lot of people take pride in, I'm not working for free. Well, you're going to have to get work experience somewhere and an internship is probably the, the way that you can do that. And you can do that with a plethora of different companies. But I took an internship, it was in real estate. Um, I liked real estate from the aspect of, I can create my own schedule, this is fun. Uh, but that's not the reason that I went into real estate. I went into real estate because I noticed that there was a need that although Yes, to some degree, you can create your own schedule and have flexibility. Uh, there's a lot more bad people in real estate than there are good. Uh, and I wanted to show people that there are good people. And uh, I went, I, that's, that's kind of how I got into real estate. It kind of just started all happening um, pretty fast for me. Once you then got into it, I believe you became one of the, the top 1% uh, in, in the nation, right? Correct. So I was an intern then I was an assistant and then I actually started working at a company that was a real estate investment company. And then is when I decided actually to become a real estate agent. And, um, within the first three months, I was the rookie of the year for the entire office. I had only been there for three months out of the year. Um, but that just went back to, you know, Everything that I do probably sounds very cliche, but I do them. And if I say that I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it. It might not be at 100%, but it's going to be done. Uh, and then we can make adjustments. And so, you know, when it comes to treating people the way you want it to be treated, when it comes to following up, when it comes to uh, just doing everything that sounds basic, if you can become an expert at the simple things in life, uh, you can drastically surpass anybody. Because if you look at any well-known entrepreneur, it's not because they have all of these degrees and they you know, broke through with some new science. Uh, it's because they work hard and it's because all of the things that seem simple to most people, they're doing while everybody else is chasing something to automate their entire life <laughs> and find the perfect schedule and find the perfect app for this and the perfect, well, the, the real business leaders of America are not doing that. And they're not focused on that. They're focused on 
relationships. They're focused on uh, what I, you know, consider the simple things, the basic things. Um, and their people, their tribe, their audience knows Jonathan has my back. Jonathan is going to do what he says. And there's nobody that's going to work harder than him. And that's how I built my business. Dude, hell yeah. I love that. I feel like <laughs> so many freaking people are just searching for the easy way to get shit done. Or they're looking for that app. Just like you said, man, you, oh, you get me fired up now. That was awesome. <laughs> I, I, I totally agree with you that it is so massively important to focus on the relationships and the fundamentals and getting so, so, so laser focused on those relationships. In, I know my life has been just transformational. I mean, I wouldn't be in Canada here if it wasn't for a relationship with one of my best friends in the business world, Kevin. Shout out to you, Kevin. And Kevin. <laughs> yeah, and uh, and but like those relationships are so critical. What I want to know is, and I, I'd love to get your your uh, whole philosophy on this is how do you develop those fundamentals, right? How do you identify which ones you need and how do you develop them over time? Uh, I won't fool anybody, I chased a lot of pennies. And I focused on uh, success. And I focused on accolades. And I got those success and accolades. Uh, but that didn't fulfill something within me uh, because I knew that there was something more, not just from a business side, but from a personal side of things. So, you know, I don't mind people chasing uh, and failing because they'll, they'll come out hopefully better than they were before. I think that if you're... 100% focused on something new, it'll never work out for you and you'll always be chasing the next bright thing. But, you know, I schedule time in my calendar, what I call project time, which is essentially time for me to explore new things that I've heard about. Or, uh, you know, I use a, uh, I use Trello for a, a project management system and I have one column that's just ideas and it just keeps building up and you know, I, I'm not allowed to focus on focus on those until the simple things are done correctly, until the current people are taken care of. So, you know, I don't I don't mind people, uh, you know, exploring. You know, that's how new things get created. That's how new inventions happen. New relationships are formed. Uh, but if you're only focused on the new, uh, you know, I tell a lot of people right now. That, that come to me, hey, we want to generate leads. I say, great, let's pull up your social media profiles and we go to the last few posts and I go, you haven't responded to any comments of people that are already engaging with you. What do you mean you want to focus on leads? You know, so it's, it's really just doing the simple things um, in being laser focused and not, not focused on what's going to happen next week, but actually what's going to focus, you know, what's our quarter goal? What's our end of the year goal? Where do I want to be in five years? You know, if you don't have it planned and you don't have it written down, it's not going to happen. Um, and, you know, I've, I can get into an argument with anybody, anybody on that. Nothing will happen in your life unless you plan for it uh, to some, some degree. So, you know, rather than complaining that your life sucks, you should probably just prepare and plan your life to be better. And it will. So just to make sure I'm, I'm fully understanding here, because I want to make sure I, I – uh... I have a, a grasp on your philosophy on this. So you plan out where you want to go. You know, you, you figure out, okay, my goals are X, Y, Z at year one, five, 10, you know, whatever, whatever time range is, is appropriate. And then you figure out, okay, what do I need to do to accomplish these goals? You reverse engineer, you figure out at a fundamental level, these are the basic things that I need to get done in order to take care of it, whether that be, I need to be speaking to, you know, two of my existing customers every day, or I need to be maintaining three accounts per day, or I need to be building two new relationships a day, whatever those fundamentals may be, and identify the skills that go along with them and practice it, and then be very organized and keep notes keep meticulous notes of the new things you want to move into, like the ideas you were talking about, but also 
a, like the list of things that you have to get done, those basic things. Is that kind of a, a grasp of it? Yeah, definitely. I think uh, what a lot of people see today, I think it's super popular is they see the how to make a million dollars in a year. And they see that infographic broken down to how much a million dollars is in a year, a month, a week, a day, a minute, and a second. And they think that's all it takes to make a million dollars. But they don't actually say it takes X amount of phone calls, X amount of emails, X amount of days where you don't sleep, X amount of failures, X amount of all these different things. And so that person will never make a million dollars because they're not planning to make a million dollars. Uh, and there are some things that I do believe you don't have to necessarily have a time frame on them. Um, I'm huge on attracting people. And if I allow people to know what I'm trying to achieve, I feel the universe will attract different things my way. Uh, and that goes into how the brain works. And that goes into the wiring of the brain and being able to change how your brain sees different things. Uh, that's why writing out your goals is so huge because if you can write your goals out every morning, your brain will actually listen to things differently in order to achieve those. It will see things differently. Why? Because it has your goal in mind. If you're very laser focused on what you want, your brain will help you to get there. It's just, it's the same reason why you go and you buy a car. Um, and, uh, You've never saw that car before. You buy the car and you drive off the car lot and everybody else has that car. Well, that's because the brain is not focused on that. And uh, yeah, so I, I, that, my philosophy is you, you plan for your miracles to happen. And when they happen, uh, you're ready for them to happen. I love that. Of being super crystal clear and getting laser focused, planning for them, seeing them, and then that attracts it attracts it. It attracts in business it. and in life, though. A lot of people do it for business, but most people do not plan for their life. Most people do not plan their vacations. Most people do not plan, uh, you know, anniversaries and milestones. Other than the fact of, hey, our anniversary is next week. Um, you know, let's do a trip. Or they, they, you have to plan your life out as well. And so when I am sitting, you know, usually during the month of December. Uh, I'm planning what's going to happen for the next year. I'm not just planning business. I'm planning life. I'm planning days off. I'm planning time where I know that I'm not going to be productive on that day. I'll be more productive on this day. So rather than trying to spread myself out too thin, again, I'm planning business and life activities. Because if you have, a, again, if you have a business you love and a life you hate, um, it's more than likely not going to work out for you. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I really couldn't because let's say you go and crush it on the business side. But for example, if you have nobody, no family or any, anybody to enjoy the fruits of your labor with, and what's the whole point of it? Like, why would you, why even do that in the first place? It's not a fun place to be. I agree. I agree. So let's, let's transition a little bit into uh, the philanthropy. Um, how did you do that? Well, first of all, can you please go into detail on exactly how cool of an award or, or how cool of an accolade you really uh, earned and then talk about how you did that? Yeah. So I didn't actually know that I was going to earn an award. I uh, was called up and I was in the military still at the time, and I was called up to go meet somebody, didn't know who it was. It was actually the press, so the newspaper reporters and stuff. And uh, there were some generals from the army there that presented me with this award uh, that was for, you know, it was essentially, it comes down to the amount of hours that you serve as a volunteer. And, you know, for me, and even in the newspaper, the newspaper article, I think the first line states that most people who are focused on volunteering and that are focused on philanthropy never assume they're going to get an award, nor are they doing it for the purpose of getting an award. So, you know, the first part of your question was, you know, how did you prepare or know about it? I really didn't know about it. But, you know, for me, it's just always been, you know, 
I never had a silver spoon growing up. You know, I thought my life was great, but looking at it now, my life was not as great as I thought it would be. Um, and I think that there's a lot of people that have a lot of potential. And so I, I volunteered with Big Brothers Big Sisters. Uh, I did a lot of toy drives. I did a lot of blood drives. I did really anything that I could um, based off of the amount of time that I have. Unfortunately, I don't have as much time now that I would like to get back uh, more time to do specific things. But every year, you know, we're feeding probably be a, probably about 400 people for Thanksgiving, for Easter, for Christmas. Um, we're doing coat drives. We did a toy drive. We do canned food. I mean, whatever it is that we can help, you know, when you, helping people for, for everybody is a little bit different. For me, you know, I don't get caught up in it. You don't usually see me helping people. And that's just usually because I don't have my phone out saying, hey, I'm standing at a, you know, volunteer event. My phone is put away and I don't even think about it. Um, I'm sure it, it would help me in other aspects to show more of that, but I'm, I'm really not focused on putting philanthropy on a pedestal to, 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 to get to new heights in business. I'm really there to just try to help more people. So for me, my next big task is developing a documentary when it comes to the stories of real estate agents, because I told you that I, a lot of people create a business that they like that they love, but their life is unfortunate. Uh, I know a lot of those people. And what you see about a real estate agent on TV, uh, for the most part, is not accurate. And uh, if it were as easy as picking up one phone and making one call and making a lot of money and not doing much, uh, probably everybody would be a real estate agent. And you know, I've seen the unfortunate stories and I wanna tell those stories because I think that as an industry, the reason that we have disruptors coming into the market and the reason that it happens in any market is because the story has not been fully told for real estate. You know, most disruptors, people that are trying to get rid of real estate agents, they're telling all the bad things. These people don't work. They don't, they, they do exactly what we can do, but we can do it for cheaper. Um, you know, they say that they're going to do all these things, but they never do. Well, that's good that the disruptors are reinforcing that because that helps them. If your answer to that is a computer can't do what I can do, you're in a, uh, in a bad spot because a computer can do what you can do. Uh, I'll, I'll be the first to tell you that computers can do a lot more than you think. And, you know, if people see the true authentic nature of a person, they truly understand them. I, I use this, this example that, you know, if somebody were to call a real estate agent at 1030 at night because they had a question about a document and that agent did not answer their phone, most people would assume that person's lazy or they're drunk or they don't care about me. They would not feel the same way if they called their doctor at 1030 at night to ask a question and that person didn't pick up the phone. So there's a drastic shift in the way that people see uh, real estate. And that's because the brain is wired to interpret what it sees and what it sees is it's easy. You don't work, uh, you get your license overnight. And so there's not really a, a, a story or there's not really uh, any framework that shows it in any other light. Sorry I, for the rant there. <laughs> I, got you, I got you confused. Rants are encouraged on the show. <laughs> well, that's what I do probably 24 <laughs> seven. <laughs> but I, I do love that. Uh, the, the idea of telling the stories of people who, who may not get the opportunity otherwise to have their story told in this manner. And because of a, because of that instance being repeated over a large number of years and people, it, it does create a certain perspective. And I totally agree with you that people look at doctors and look at real estate agents totally differently. Absolutely. A hundred percent differently. Um, so I love the, the mission of telling those stories of people who haven't yet had, had their stories told. That's actually one of the big, big reasons why I'm doing the show 
that's that's one of the main driving factors. You know, I think of somebody like like Confucius way back in the day. I mean, you know, thousands of years ago when Confucius was a young man, he was traveling around and going and talking to people. And one day he actually came in contact with Lao Tzu, the founder of Taoism, and they had a conversation. Clearly they butted heads because they're like, you know, very different philosophies. But that conversation to have been able to share that, to document that and share that, oh, that would have been amazing. So that, that's why I feel so strongly that we have to now share the stories of people today because you never know how important those stories are going to be 10,000 years from now, 20,000 years from now. So I, I, love, I love that mission. Kudos to you. <laughs> Thanks. What sort of what sort of progress have you made on it? Like, where are you in, in the, the process? So our, our first journey was to develop a program for real estate agents to learn social media marketing and also learn how storytelling is incorporated with that. The brain uses two parts when you tell a fact and it uses five parts when you tell a story. What that means is a lot of people that are telling facts, they never encapsulate the brain they come at the brain from the front when you should be coming at the brain from the back and the reason that you want to do that is because if you can enter the back of the brain you can plant your brand yourself your company uh, in somebody's brain uh, and it allows it allows you to tell the story in which they fit themselves into it and for real estate that's huge because if i tell you that i'm selling a three-bedroom two-bath house that's great but that's just a fact. Well, if I tell you about the lifestyle and I'll tell you about the experience and I tell you how it can benefit you and your family, well, now you're envisioning yourself as a part of that story. So storytelling is huge. And uh, we, we started with the goal of teaching people how to tell a story because most people only teach you how to do something specific or some trick or some hack or how to set this up. Well, that's great, but those are facts. We want to show you how you can do that and incorporate story uh, into the things that you're doing so they actually resonate with people. So they actually um, fit themselves into the story. And it's not about the number of likes and comments that you get. It's about uh, how many people can fit themselves into this particular piece of content. Because the more times they do that, the more direct messages you get, the more emails you get, the more calls you get, the more text you get. Uh, and that's really where your goal should be within social media. So as far as the uh, documentary is concerned, our plan is to, we're actually finishing up our beta program on Friday, which is exciting. And all of next month, we are uh, revamping our full platform for a launch in August. And once that's launched, uh, then we're actually going to be uh, doing some crazy stuff and going around the country and, uh, and, and wrapping it up. So we're, we're excited about it. That's amazing. 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 So Jonathan, I want to thank you so, so much for uh, coming on the show today and, you know, sharing everything that you're doing and, and your philosophies and um, giving us a little exciting uh, sneak sneak peek of what's what's coming up and uh, as far as the documentary goes so thank you so much and i really do appreciate your time i appreciate it thank you again absolutely and to everybody who's watching and listening i want to thank you all very very much um, your time is very valuable and so i'm very grateful that you choose to share some of that with us today so thank you very much i love y'all and i will see you on the next episode